Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. The series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Dr. Mark Trudell. Mark is a research scientist at the St. Andrews Biological Station in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Victoria. Mark was born and grew up in Montreal. He completed his BSc in biology at the Université de Montréal. He stayed there for his master's, which focused on the bioenergetics of minnows. Mark went to McGill University for his PhD, which focused on the accumulation of mercury in freshwater fish. This research was conducted on a much larger lake system. He then went to the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo for a two-year postdoc to work on the bioenergetics of Pacific salmon. He remained there for an additional 14 years and worked on marine ecology of Pacific salmon to understand how climate and ocean conditions affect their distribution, migration, growth, and survival at sea. He relocated to the East Coast in 2016 and currently focuses his research on aquatic okay. ecosystem interactions. After the presentation, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session, and you'll have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Mark. Well, thank you, Darla, and hopefully everybody can hear me well. Um, just to let you know also that uh, if there are any questions in French, I'll be happy to answer them in French. So, uh, first of all, thank you, Darla, for the invitation to give this presentation. It's a pleasure to be here to present some of the work we're doing here uh, on Atlantic salmon on the east coast of Canada. But before I start, I just want to make sure that I acknowledge the uh, contribution of my collaborators on this project. So even though I'm the one speaking today, uh, this project involves a large number of people, both at DFO here in San Andrews, as well as uh, Halifax and Quebec. And also it, it involves people from University of Dalhousie, uh, the Atlantic Center Federation, and also from uh, NOAA Fisheries. So I'm sure that most of you are aware that Atlantic salmon are not doing very well in, uh, particularly in the Maritime region of uh, Canada, as well as in uh, Eastern uh, the United States, where uh, salmon has been extirpated for a lot from a large number of uh, rivers. And those that are still have salmon uh, frequently don't produce enough salmon to meet their conservation uh, requirement. This happens even though the commercial fishery for Atlantic salmon has been closed since the mid 80s and in the maritime region in particular and also in the US, uh, these rivers have been closed also for recreational fisheries. So there's not even uh, any fishing or harassment because some of these populations are listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act or the uh, Species at Risk Act in Canada and also by the uh, Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. Now, there are certainly multiple causes and probably not a single uh, smoking gun that could explain those declines, but because they've happened over such a broad, broad geographic area uh, under various conditions, uh, ICs uh, suggest that uh, what's potentially driving these declines are related to changes that happen in the ocean environment either during the first year or the second year at sea and that these could be either both local or broad, broad ocean scale uh, ocean conditions. Now the question is, where should we look to try to understand what's happening to salmon in the ocean? Uh, salmon do uh, undertake extensive migration all the way up to the west coast of West Greenland, except maybe for the inner Bay of Fundy salmon that seem to reside in the Bay of Fundy as well as uh, in the Gulf of Maine. So it's a fairly large geographic area to cover. And then the other question is, is there anything we can do about it to try to help uh, reverse the trends? What would be helpful to us is if there was a critical period that was over a fairly small geographic area that would determine or drive the abundance of salmon in the ocean. So Hjort in 1914, uh, uh, presented a uh, concept called the critical period, which is a stage in the life of a fish that uh, dictates or uh, defines the abundance of a given cohort. 
Now, for athletic salmon, there was a review paper that was published in 2012 by Eva Thorstad and her colleague, which suggests that maybe uh, the transition between fresh water to salt water, as well as the early marine phase, could represent uh, a critical bottleneck for the survival of Atlantic salmon. And they've also identified a number of potential uh, anthropogenic stressors that could uh, affect the survival of salmon during their uh, downstream migration as well as their early marine life. So one of them being the passage to a hydropower system and as well as their potential subsequent interactions with agriculture. Now, there are many factors that could affect the survival of salmon as they go through a hydropower system. This is just an example from the Pacific Northwest, where uh, one of the first things that can happen is that by creating reservoirs, you can change the distribution of potential predators that could feed, feed on the smokes as they're coming down. Uh, you could also have predators that are concentrating at the bottom of the hydropower system that could feed on these fish as they're coming down. Um, in some cases, the fish have various options for their downstream migration. They could go through a spillway or to a, a bypass system. And for some of the unlucky ones, they could go through the turbines and be injured physically and die uh, because of those injuries. Or they could, they could be subjected to high pressure and gas bubble trauma, which could be manifested later on. And they could be also become disorientated. And also some of these effects, even though they could be manifested fairly early as they leave the uh, hydropower system, either through them or through the predator gauntlet, some of those effects could be manifested later on in the marine life. And we don't, re they're called latent effect. And we don't really understand much about where and when those latent effects actually occurred. Another stressor that uh, people have often identified, uh, or potential uh, stressor, is the interaction with agriculture. And one of them is the potential for exchange of pathogens between wild and farm and farm and wild fish. So one thing to keep in mind is that when those fish are introduced in the cages, they typically are uh, pathogen free and parasite free. And over time, they can acquire pathogens and parasites from either uh, wild fish that are in the area or from neighboring farms. And that these pathogens can be amplified in the farms and be spilled back into the environment and potentially affect salmon. Another uh, things that can happen around agriculture cages is that it can attract forage fish that are potentially either feeding on the food that some of the salmon don't feed. Uh, there's also change in the hydrodynamics that can happen that can retain zooplankton. So those fish here could potentially be feeding on zooplankton or save with aquacultures, or they could be trying to escape predators, which also can lead to predator attractions that can try to feed on the forage fish, try to feed on the fish that are on the cage or on the salmon that are migrating nearby. <laughs> And the third one is for the fish that are in the cage to potentially escape the cages. Now, most people tend to focus on the potential uh, for these fish to migrate into fresh water and spawn with wild conspecifics. But another effect that these uh, escapees could potentially have in the marine ecosystem is they can uh, attract predators that are feeding on salmon and predators eventually could learn the behavior on feeding on salmon and potentially feed again on wild migrating fish. But uh, the uh, effect of predators attracted, first of all, we don't know to what extent the predators are attracted to the cages and to what extent they are actually um, uh, contributing to the mortality of salmon in the marine environment. So we started a uh, study in 2018 as a pilot project, which we uh, expanded in 2019 to try to understand the migration routes and residence time of Atlantic salmon in Pasmacodi Bay. Uh, we also wanted to determine the stage specific survival from the uh, estuary to the open in, uh, ocean. We also wanted to determine to what extent juvenile salmon are interacting with salmon aquacultures in the marine ecosystem, trying to better understand the predation of salmon in the ocean and also to understand the cumulative effects of multiple stressors such as going through dams, fisheries, and also agriculture. 
So, <coughs> sorry, I'm, I'm going to cough a little bit here because I'm still recovering from a cold and I may take a few sips from, of coffee to help me from time to time. So, just some, uh, my apologies for this. So, the study here was conducted in Pasmakodi Bay. So, Pasmakodi Bay is located in southwest New Brunswick, right at the border of Maine and New Brunswick. Uh, this is St. Andrews, where I live. And um, in this, uh, for this project, we use acoustic telemetry to detect salmon that would be migrating down the Megadivic River and through the, uh, the dam in the Megadivic River, through the estuary, as well as throughout the uh, Pasmakodi Bay itself, uh, also uh, at the aquaculture sites and also as they're leaving the area here. So all in all, we've put 129 receivers uh, at various locations, including at uh, most of the aquaculture sites in two different bay management area. Uh, this is bay management, bay management area one and three C, where the fish were either introduced uh, last year or some of the cages are empty, and bay management area two, where the fish were introduced this year. Um, we used different uh, receivers. Some of them were on acoustic release. Some of them were deployed by divers. Um, and uh, we also used uh, one kind of tag this year, which was called the V7 that had a temperature and pressure sensor so that we could get additional information aside the, the detection of the fish. And the pressure sensor can give us an idea of the depth of the fish. Uh, when we released the fish, one of our colleagues also released drifters to get a sense of what the currents were doing as they are leaving uh, the, the estuary here and also released drifters here at, right at the mouth of the estuary. And he also deployed a series of, of uh, current meters uh, throughout the bay here as well as on the other side here to look at what the currents are doing while Simon were migrating that area. In addition to those fixed receivers, we also did some manual tracking on a small vessel. So we had a probe here that we dropped in the water at all the stations are marked by the plus and listen for uh, the presence of fish with a dead box. And we also collected water samples at areas uh, near and away from aquaculture sites to look at potential distribution of pathogens in the water. <coughs> and also when the fish were leaving Pesmacote Bay, at least those that survived there, we we're hoping that in the long run that we could get additional information on the uh, time it took them to reach uh, a line of receivers that the Ocean Tracking Network had deployed off Halifax and also uh, if they decided to turn left uh, instead of going right of uh, Newfoundland uh, through Cabot Strait. But I don't think we have received those results yet so we don't know if the fish uh, and how many of them made it that far this year. Now, we would have loved to do this study on wild smolts on the Megadivic River, but there's so few adults coming back that it's not possible to tag enough smolts coming down the river to do uh, a study that is, um, uh, has enough sample size to be uh, statistically robust. So instead, we used uh, salmon from the St. John River that were reared at the Magdaquac Biodiversity Facility, and these fish are the uh, Mactiqua, uh, not Mactiqua, but the, from the Megadivic River uh, area. Uh, the surgery was done uh, under an aesthetic bath, and the fish basically were uh, hydrated with a solution of uh, uh, anesthetic that went through their gills. And uh, surgery typically took three or uh, four, uh, three, two to three minutes each, and then we let the fish recover for two days in the hatchery uh, before we move them uh, to the release site. Also, when we did the surgery, we took a small biopsy of the gills to get a sense of the health of the fish. And so we haven't received the results of this yet, but this is uh, stuff that will be uh, coming soon, uh, hopefully. And we released the fish at two uh, time periods, uh, in late May and mid-June, at two locations. One was below the dam, the estuary, and the other one was above the dam uh, in the Megadivic River. And the, the dam is located somewhere around here. And the, the star shows you the release location and the red dots show uh, some of the uh, receivers that we had deployed in the uh, river itself in estuary. 
Now we had a number of challenges in 2019. Number one is we had a large number of receivers in a small geographic area, so that was 129 receivers. Uh, and we've lost uh, six of those receivers, um, or two that we know what they are, but we uh, somehow the release mechanism is not working. Two that went to the surface, but uh, disappeared before we could recover them. One that we lost contact, uh, so we don't know where it is. And the other one is uh, we haven't found the uh, surface floats that uh, indicate where it is, so we don't know if the surface floats have been covered or not. But despite that, it's still 123 receivers for which we have a large number of information. Uh, we have a total of over 3 million detections for all those receivers. So these represent not only salmon tags, but tags from other researchers, and also some of those um, receivers send a signal as well as some sync tags that we've put to try to synchronize uh, some of those receivers. Uh, but we still have about half a million of those detections were from salmon. So that's a lot of data. We haven't finished analyzing those data. Uh, so what we're going to present are fairly preliminary, but uh, still uh, the story shouldn't change much uh, once we do the full analysis. We tagged a total of 160 smolts. So the two release groups, we released uh, 80 fish on each day and 40 fish above them, the dam and 40 fish below the dam on each of the release days. The tag were programmed to send a signal roughly every 30 seconds. So, uh, and because of that, that created a lot of tag collisions into uh, the, um, uh, once the fish were released, especially in the river and the estuary. So as a result, uh, because we found a number of tags that were stationary in the river, we deployed additional uh, receivers to try to passively listen to some tags just to get a better sense of which tag uh, were still in the area. And this is just to give you an idea of what uh, the tag collision sounds like. So you'll hear multiple ticks here and there that are overlapping one another. And when that happens, we basically, the machine uh, can't, discriminate uh, any of those tag signals. So this is just to give you a sense. So it takes a few seconds to for uh, a tag code to be completely decoded. So when there's too many tags that happen, is that there's a signal that overlays over another one. And because of that, we miss a lot of, uh, potentially miss a lot of detection, especially in the river and then potentially at the mouth of the estuary. So <laughs> I'm gonna start by presenting the results of the first two objectives. And also I'll be talking about the cumulative effects in these, uh, this segment here. So the first thing is uh, when you look at the residence time, uh, the fish that were released above the dam spend a little bit less on average than half a day into the river before going down into the estuary. And once uh, the fish went to the estuary, they spent roughly a day and a half to two days on average. Some of the fish spend a little bit longer than that, especially for the fish that were released above the dam. But there didn't seem to be much difference uh, in terms of residence time for the fish that were released either above or below the dam in the estuary. One of the things that we've noticed when we release these fish uh, is that there are often a lot of predators around the area, especially in the basin. Uh, so here, for instance, this was an osprey, some bald eagles. There was also uh, some seals at times. And the image in the bottom here, which you can see potentially just small black things here, and this one here is not so black. These are cormorants, and there were over 15 cormorants uh, at this particular shot here, uh, including two different species of cormorants. So that's a lot of potential predators that can be feeding on salmon and other things that are in the environment. And this is just an example of, of a predation event by an osprey into that area. And it's carrying a fish in its uh, claws. We don't think this is necessarily a salmon, it could be a gastro uh, because there was gastro that was coming back uh, at the same time. 
Now, the thing is happening in this river at times, uh, or in the estuary, is that as the gas are coming in, there's often uh, a fishery for gas uh, And you can see some of the large nets uh, that are in the estuary, as well as uh, just as you're leaving the gorge, uh, there's some other nets that can be deployed there. Um, and when we release the fish at low tides, the water is coming primarily from this direction to this direction. And there's about six to seven meters of water that is pushing uh, the water that way. So we're a bit concerned that the fish would potentially be uh, trapped by those nets. But even with this in mind, survival in the estuary was fairly low, basically uh, so fairly, fairly high. Uh, roughly about three quarters of the fish that we released uh, or that made it through the estuary survived. What was interesting is the fish that were released above the dam had different survival rates. So for the first release day, it's about three quarters of the fish survive compared to 30% of the fish on the second release day. And I remember when we released the fish on the second release day, we could see bubbling activities and as if the fish were trying to escape predators when we released them. So we thought that we uh, were onto something at that point where we could have identified a period of high. Sometimes you have to put this in, things into perspective. That is, uh, when you look at the timing of the small migration, uh, the second release group occurred near the tail end, if not at the tail end of the migration window of the smolt. So even if 100% of those smolts were uh, died because of various things, it wouldn't necessarily affect the overall uh, migration success of the population because it's such a small proportion of the population that we'd be subjected to that, to that uh, mortality event. Uh, compared to the first release group where about three quarters of the fish survive. So one thing is important is to try to capture the survival throughout the migration window. Um, so I think we may have missed the peak and maybe just a bit before the peak as well. So hopefully in future years, we'll try to adjust the release timing uh, as a fund to better characterize the survival throughout the migration window. In terms of the, the timing of migration out of the estuary, uh, it happened pretty much at any time and phase of the uh, the tides. So, for instance, here we saw some fish leaving the estuary uh, when there was some daylight at uh, ebb tide, at flood tide during the night, at ebb tide during the night, and also at flood tide during the day. Uh, and the, the symbols that are red represent the fish that were released above the dam compared to below the dam. So, because these fish spent or on average half an extra day in the uh, fresh water before coming down, they were observed migrating a little bit later. In terms of movement in the ocean, so the first thing I wanna show you is the detection from the manual tracking. Uh, so the yellow, cir uh, not circles, but uh, crosses represent the places where we had positive detections of uh, salmon that had been uh, observed into the ocean. So, and as you can see, most of these fish here were detected in the north end of Pasmokoti Bay, as well as through the Western Passage. And when we downloaded the data from the receivers, 60% of the fish were detected leaving Pasmokoti Bay through the Western Passage compared to 21% from the uh, Big Latit and 12% from Little Latit. And the fish, once they left this area, for those that made it out, 94% left through that line here, and only 6% went through uh, between Campobello and the state of Maine. So which suggests that overall the migration of the fish seems to be taking them, for the most part, obviously, <coughs> uh, through the Western Passage, maybe through the north end of, of uh, Pasmacote Bay, and then out through uh, the Fundy Isles. Now the question is, what happens to the fish once they leave these areas? They, there's different options, and we don't really know what it is to do at, at that point. All we know is that there's a few fish that were detected leaving here, were detected just right here in the Quadian Arrows. So some of those fish seem potentially to be going along the shore. Uh, but we don't really know that for sure. And hopefully next year, um, we hope that the ocean tracking network will be successful at uh, getting funding to put another line of receivers 
uh, that go from the New Brunswick to Grand Manan and Grand Manan to Nova Scotia. But in the meantime, we're starting some modeling work uh, with some oceanographers to try to see or better understand the migration behavior or what kind of behavior the salmon have to take in order to leave that area. So this is just an example. This is really very preliminary. There's a lot more that needs to be done here. Uh, but this is just showing a run for an example of a fish that was uh, assumed to leave here in uh, the Megalit River estuary and uh, was left drifting with the currents for about 12 days, uh, sorry, not 12 days, two weeks. And the star represent the last location from that particular simulation. So this fish here after two weeks would have been uh, residing somewhere in uh, Passamaquoddy Bay itself. If you compare this, for instance, for a fish that had negative real taxes, or that is that it would um, not try to go with the current, but try to go uh, against the current, um, the fish, uh, after two weeks, would have spent some time in Passamaquoddy Bay, gone uh, through Western Passage into Cobscook Bay in the U.S., and then come back and eventually leave to the Fundy Isles and be here uh, two weeks later. Now, <coughs> we did have some fish going into uh, this area, but we don't know what it is that they do here because we all we had is a series of receiver right here. So this is not uh, an impossible behavior for those fish to adopt, but what we don't know is what these fish do once they leave this area. In terms of residence time, so we saw the resident sign earlier in the um, uh, river in the estuary. In the bay itself, it looks like they spend roughly four to five days uh, in what we call the inner bay and the outer bay portion. So from the time we, re we released them to the time they left the area, it took anywhere between five to uh, seven days and a half for these fish to, to leave this area. So it's a fairly short residence time altogether. And it doesn't seem to be much difference whether or not the fish were released uh, above the dam or below the dam, except for the, uh, the time they spent obviously above the dam. In terms of survival into the marine environment, once they leave the estuary, uh, it was actually fairly high. Like it ranged from 90 to 86% to uh, about 100% for a cumulative survival of 20% to 60%. And again, as I said before, I think that this is potentially, uh, while this is large uh, mortality, this potentially affect a very small proportion of the population uh, that would be migrating at that time. Uh, in terms of interactions with aquaculture, um, there's 15 of the 24 aquaculture sites that detected tagged salmon. Uh, and in some places, we had deployed more than one receiver. So uh, it's a total of 34 out of the 44 receivers that we had deployed at, at aquaculture sites that detected salmon. Uh, in terms of the bay management area, there's uh, in bay management area 1 and 3C, all the sites detected salmon except for two. And in bay management area 2A, there was only one site that detected salmon. And uh, each site, uh, when they detected salmon, it was between one to 27 salmon. In terms of residence time at an individual uh, aquaculture site, it was on average about 15 minutes. And this year, it was about 71% of the fish that entered the ocean uh, that were detected near an aquaculture site. And this is just to show you, an example of potential uh, where some of those fish were detected. So this is obviously a linear interpolation. We don't really know what the fish do between those locations, but you can see, for instance, this fish here that was detected in the estuary, then in a little uh, big little teeth, back around uh, Minister's Island, uh, through some aquaculture site, through little petite, some aquaculture sites again, more aquaculture sites, back into uh, the outer array here, again, back and forth a few times uh, compared to that fish here that went uh, and did uh, something quite different. Uh, again, in terms of interactions with aquaculture, there's um, some fish uh, were detected at more, more than one site. So uh, 19 of the 60 fish, six fish that we detected to the aquaculture sites were just detected at a single site. 
28 of them were detected at two site at two farms, uh, nine at three, six at four, two at five, and two at uh, six farms. And I should mention this is not visited farms, but were detected at farms. <laughs> and in terms of the cumulative residence time at uh, multiple aquaculture sites, it ends up being roughly about 25 to 30 minutes with the vast majority of the fish spending less than an hour and in the upwards of four hours for some fish. So it's fairly short residence time uh, for the most part at aquaculture sites. Now, one of the things that we want to do this year is to try to better understand what the uh, predation events on salmon. Like for instance, when we did the work in 2008, sometimes we saw some odd behaviors. And I think the, the previous example was also showed some odd behaviors where you have a fish that is detected leaving the area, then, uh, sorry, the Megavik River estuary, then uh, it's been seen of Big Latif, then going back inside the Samoa Bay and going back and forth uh, between um, the different arrays we have of Western Passage and then dying somewhere in the Western Passage. So <coughs> there was a, an interesting migration path for that fish and one could question whether or not this is actually a salmon because all the information we get from that tag is whether or not it's been detected near uh, a receiver within a certain detection range. It doesn't tell us if this is still inside the salmon or if it's in, inside uh, the stomach of a predator that's consumed this. We have one example, for instance, of a fish that we had released in 2018 uh, in the basin that we never detected in the estuary, but we detected it then after that several times around uh, Hospital Island. So we think that this fish here, for instance, was consumed by a bird, and uh, this represents the resting location of the tag after the bird that digested the fish. This is the, basically the pooping location of the, the fish. So this year we used a different kind of tag. Um, these tags have the temperature and pressure sensors, uh, and we're, we thought that by combining this information, we could gain some insights in terms of uh, not only if there's a predation event, but also the nature of the predators that happen. So salmon are uh, cold-blooded and they, the temperature tends to be the same as the ambient water. And they also tend to be surface oriented. So they'll typically be uh, somewhere on the surface. So seeing change in the uh, diving behavior would potentially be indicative of a predation event. But also combining this with the temperature information, sorry, we could gain some insight in terms of the nature of the predators. For instance, if it was a cold blooded predator like a striped bass, well, the temperature of the fish or the tag that would report would be similar to what is reporting for salmon. If it was uh, some other predators like uh, great white sharks or tunas or poor beagle sharks, they, their temperature tend to be elevated by about 10 degrees Celsius relative to the ambient water. So if this was consumed by, if a salmon had been consumed by these things here, the temperature would be reported by the tag to be somewhere probably around the 20 degrees Celsius. If it was consumed by a marine mammal, such as a seal or whale, uh, the temperature would be uh, around 35 degrees Celsius. And if it had been consumed by a marine bird, uh, the temperature would be somewhere around uh, above 40 degrees Celsius. So this year we had five examples of fish that had been tagged where the temperature was fairly low, like around 10 degrees Celsius and sometimes dropping. And then all of a sudden temperature increased to 35 degrees Celsius, which suggests that they were consumed by marine mammals. And in this particular case, you can see also the temperature dropping uh, a little bit in the marine mammal uh, at two occasions, roughly by a degree or so, which suggests that this marine mammal was also feeding uh, during those periods here. So the tag was detecting cold things coming in into the stomachs at the same time. And this is just showing you what the movement pattern of some of those uh, tags would do. So for instance, this tag here was detected here in the Pasmacodi, uh, in the Western Passage and then eventually uh, observed going back inside Pasmacodi Bay, back and forth, and then we lost it. Uh, and then this tag here was uh, <laughs> first detected here uh, in terms of high temperature and uh, went to various places before we, we lost it. So 
three out of the five uh, predation event occurred right here, uh, or first detected here in, in the uh, Western Passage. One was detected near the aquaculture site here, and one was first detected here. What this doesn't tell us, though, is where the predation event actually happened. It just shows us when it was first detected uh, in the stomach of uh, a seal. But nevertheless, it's only 5% of the fish that were consumed by marine mammals uh, in that particular year. And also, as we're downloading data, we, we also had a, a number of interesting surprises. Uh, for instance, we had 28 tag codes that were not related to any of the fish that we had tagged that were detected multiple times. Uh, five of those tags were detected only at aquaculture sites. Six of them were only uh, detected in the fixed array. And seven of them were detected in both aquaculture sites and fixed arrays. Uh, we don't know the species of 20 of those four tags, 24 of those tags, sorry. Uh, we know that there's at least one great white shark that was detected. There's also uh, two fish that we suspect are sharks and one fish that we suspect is a sturgeon because we saw it moving from the Mega River estuary and into the um, uh, St. Croix River. And we also had uh, one tag code that was detected almost simultaneously across multiple receivers. And we think this is a high power sonar. Uh, and that occurred around the uh, 4th of July. And we know there were some uh, ships from the US Navy that were there. So we think that this could be related to them sending signals into the water. Uh, but this is just an example of a great white shark that was uh, detected here inside Pesmacoli Bay on uh, August 22nd. And uh, we don't know which great white shark uh, was actually observed there, but uh, there were some sightings of uh, great white feeding on seals uh, on the other side of Deer Island uh, this summer. <coughs> so, despite all these wonderful results, we should also acknowledge that there's some limitations in terms of what we're seeing. Uh, one of them, as was discussed, is that the release timing uh, of the smolt need to occur within the migration window of the smolt. So in this case here, I think we may have missed uh, the peak of the migration. So we need to be cognizant of this, especially in future studies to try to encapsulate the whole migration window. The manual tracking is great because it gives us intermediate position of the fish that the uh, 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 fixed receivers provide us, but we miss most of the fish uh, because we the fish are moving at the same time. There's some areas that are quite noisy, especially uh, in, in the exit, you know, the passageways, because there's a lot of currents. There's some boats and whatnot that could be interfering with the detection of, of uh, salmon. And sometimes some of those receivers are brought nearly parallel to the ocean floor, so we don't really know how it's affecting the efficiency of the array at that time. The other thing that I've mentioned earlier that we need to keep in mind in every tagging studies is that all we're detecting is the signal from the tag. We don't know if the fish is alive or dead at that time. We hope that by using the temperature and pressure sensor uh, at this point here, uh, help us to identify the fate of the fish. There are new tags that are available that can tell us if the fish is dead or not, uh, but we haven't used them at this point here. And also, we can't tell how far the fish are from the receivers when we're detecting it. All we can say is that it's been detected within the detection range of the receiver. In this case here, it's about a uh, half kilometer. So, to quickly summarize <clears throat> the main results in relation to the objectives of the work. So, as uh, we've discussed initially, the uh, primary objective was to determine the migration routes uh, in residence time. So. The results suggest that the, the residence time in the estuary is highly variable with some fish migrating late, but most of the time it was usually uh, a day and a half to two days uh, into the estuary. Uh, but the ocean entry occurred at any phase of the tides, either during the day or during the night. Um, the smolts, the post smolts, don't spend that much time in the packed up Smokoti Bay area, typically about five days or less. And most of the fish seem to be leaving the area through the Western Passage and then eventually to the Fundy Islands. Uh, survival was fairly high in the estuary. About three quarters of the fish survived through the estuary. 
And even survival in the ocean, in the, at least in the early marine phase, was fairly high. Um, and uh, the result from the release, and we suggest that the survival may be affecting by the timing of the migration uh, of the small, <coughs> or the timing of the release. But overall, survival is fairly high uh, in the early part of their uh, marine life. Just potentially that if there's a bottleneck, may happen outside the early marine phase later than, than what we thought. In terms of interactions with aquaculture sites, uh, on average, at a single site, they spend uh, the fish that were detected there uh, spend about 15 minutes, and it was a fairly large proportion. So with 71% of the fish were detected at aquaculture sites, with some of the fish going near sites uh, for uh, on more than one site, uh, with an average of about 26 minutes uh, for the combined uh, residence time, and we with the Temperature tags and pressure tags were able to determine that about 5% of the smolts were consumed by marine mammals in the bay, um, which is a fairly small uh, percentage uh, of the mortality that was due to marine mammal predation. And in terms of the cumulative effect, at this point here, and this is very preliminary, but there doesn't seem to be any difference in terms of residence time and survival of the fish, at least within uh, the uh, Magnet River and the basin itself, uh, not the basin, but the, the uh, Masmukudi Bay area. Uh, but we don't know if there's some other effects that are manifested later on. And hopefully, as I said, next year, uh, if all goes well, the Atlantic and not the Ocean Track Network will receive funding to put some additional receivers into the Bay of Fundy. And we can study uh, what happens to these fish once they leave the Pasmakodi Bay um, before reaching Halifax. So with that, I'll stop here. Uh, and we just want to acknowledge the uh, collaboration of various partners here, and uh, we'll take up uh, any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. That was a great presentation. Um, so as Mark said, we'll now open the session for our question and answer period. So to ask a question, you can uh, use your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box you should be seeing in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If the box is minimized, just hit the uh, arrow at the top and that will re-enlarge it again. So if you're using um, your, if you have a speaker, you can figuratively raise your hand, which is the little hand icon and we'll unmute you so you can ask your question directly or you can type in your question on the control panel and we can read it aloud for you. Um, a aussi un petit rappel que uh, Marc a déjà dit, mais vous pouvez poser vos questions en français si vous le souhaitez. So we'll just give folks a moment to get themselves organized. Um, while we're waiting for our questions to arrive, um, I'll just give folks a little reminder that our next webinar is going to be held on January 8th. Andy Smith of the Department of National Defense will be speaking about project prioritization and restoration of watershed processes at the 5th Canadian Division Support Base Gage Town. So we've got our first question here now. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Penny asks, do you think the smolt were drawn to the aquaculture sites or did the sites just happen to be on their migration route? Um, I think that, that the, the site just happened to be on their migration path. Like when you look at it, like it's just 15 minutes of their life that they spend near the aquaculture site. So it's not very long, but next year uh, we're planning to uh, do the same kind of work and the aquaculture sites uh, in, in the bay management area one should be followed and we're going to put the receivers in the exact same spot so we'll see if the fish uh, are going to go in the same areas uh, again next year and how long they spend in those areas as well. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question now from Frank Johnson. Um, Frank, uh, would you like to ask your question directly? Okay, I'm not getting a response, so I'll just, he's also typed it in. Um, Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, <laughs> so his question is, does the tag effect rate, uh, does the tag affect rate of survival? It's, 
very possible that I, we do have some colleagues in Newfoundland that are uh, trying um, a different approach to assess to what extent the fish are either losing tags or having different survival rates. Um, so I'm not sure what the result of their study is, but it's one of those things where uh, it's like, uh, how do you call this? Not Schrodinger's cat, but um, yeah, I guess it's Schrodinger's cat. So you, you, you either do it and manipulate the system and, and hope you get some results, but at the same time, you can potentially uh, affect the outcome. But the tag in our case is fairly small relative to the size of the fish that some of the lab work has been done in the past suggests that the effects would be fairly small, but we cannot discount that they have other effects in the wild that are uh, more subtle. Thank you, Mark. And, and even with that in mind, I, I was going to say, just to add one more thing there before I forget, uh, still, the even if it did affect the fish, survival in our case was still fairly high, uh, both in the estuary and the ocean. So uh, if it affects them, it would affect them in a negative way. So you could see this as minimal survival estimates if you want to. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question and comment comes from Pedro Nilo, uh, who writes, Thank you. thanks for the nice presentation, Mark. You gave us a hint about some fish predated by birds. Is it possible to estimate their impact on small? Um, well, we, we only had one example of a bird that we think is a bird that consume salmon, which was uh, just last year where the fish was not detected at any of the receivers that we had put in, in the estuary. So, uh, and it was detected later on. So uh, unfortunately, like I was hoping that one of the bird would have consumed uh, a smolt and then uh, uh, not swim by, but dive by a receiver and detect at some point uh, a temperature in the order of 40 degrees Celsius. But we didn't see that uh, in any of the tags that we had this year. So it doesn't mean that the birds did not consume the smolts, uh, but we just don't know of the 25% of the smolt that are consumed in the estuary how many of these are actually consumed by birds versus consumed by other fish. Um, they probably were not consumed by seals because a seal would have been gone back and forth and would have detected a 37 degrees Celsius in the estuary, which we didn't, uh, or they could have died of uh, just a physiological imbalance and, and the fish could have just been pushed towards the, the shore. So, I, I don't know if we can do it with that technology at this point here, but um, uh, it certainly is a, a challenging question to, to answer or an address. Thank you. Um, yeah. Our next question comes from Jeff Giffen, who, who says, hi, Mark. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. Will you be looking at other types of interactions, such as timing and location of small movements in relation to reported sea lice abundance and treatments at the facilities within the study area? Um, we, well, I, I do get information from the uh, Atlantic Canada Fish Farmers Association in terms of uh, when some of those sites are being treated. I don't have access to the uh, sea lice data, but um, so in, in bay management area two, it doesn't look like they're going there at all. So we're, we're still going to repeat this next year. Uh, but I don't anticipate that uh, the fish will will be uh, interacting with aquaculture much in that area. So it's mostly with uh, um, the Bay Management Area 1 where we expect these interactions to occur and also around Grandman and maybe in the future years. Uh, but we're planning to do some modeling work to try to see if there were uh, parasites or pathogens originating from the aquaculture sites to what extent they could interact with salmon as they're migrating by. So the uh, work that we started doing with the, I'm just gonna try to go back a little bit here. If I can find my cursor here, blah, blah, blah. Just uh, here. So 
this is modeling the dispersal of salmon and eventually what we'd like to do is also overlay the dispersal of potential parasites and pathogens if they were coming from the farms and see to what extent they're overlapping in distribution in space and time with salmon. That's probably the best we can do uh, at this point here. Um, and um, and again, like just keep in mind, the fish spend only 15 minutes uh, around the aquaculture sites or half an hour if you do the combination. Uh, but it, it, again, just keep in mind also that water is moving a lot. Like the tides here are phenomenal. Uh, it's six to seven meters of water that are being going up and down twice a day so uh so i think the modeling exercise is going to be potentially a bit more informative um and we're, we're also collecting uh, or at least the students from the Dalhousie university were collecting water samples to look at potential pathogens in water as well so this is to come in the future and thanks for the question Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, I think that was our last question. So I'd just like to give, say a huge thank you again to you for the presentation today. Um, and I'd like to also thank everyone who logged in to participate. Uh, we hope you can all join us again very soon. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks, Adana, for the opportunity. <laughs>